three of them. Thank you so much, Steve. It's really a pleasure to be here today. And I'm a GU medical oncologist, so I take care of all patients with urologic cancers. And I've taken care of patients with kidney cancer now for more than 20 years. And all of the um, drugs that we have had in kidney cancer have been sort of similar to what we have thought of for VHL, because in sporadic cancer, as Dr. Srinivasan said, much of it is related to VHL. So even though I've not had a chance to take care of too many patients with VHL, except for this past year, much of what we know is very similar. My talk is going to be really short because Dr. Srinivasan covered almost all of my uh, slides that I was going to do. And I was going to say, our names are so similar. You know, mine is Srinivas and his is Srinivasan. So I think the extra uh, alphabets just gives him that much more smartness. So he's covered everything that I have to say. And the extra two alphabets, I think, also gives him a longer um, length of his talk. So I'm going to keep mine really short because I just want to give a different perspective from what I think what I've heard today and learned today is just BHL is just so complicated, you know, unlike uh, so as a medical oncologist, when I take care of patients with metastatic disease, we own the patient. We really do as medical oncologists, we give them drug therapy. I call Dr. Chung and say, hey, this patient needs part of their kidney removed. Could you do that? I send my patient to Dr. Chang and say, this patient has metastatic disease. You know, could you uh, do radiation, cyber knife? So it's really a very different um, aspect of care here, that one thing that I think for us here at Stanford, which would be, I mean, we, we have in oncology, we have tumor boards. So as you can already see, Dr. Chang and Dr. Larry Recht work in the neurology space. So they have the ability to to connect and say this patient needs CNS treatment. But for a VHL patient, it's not just CNS disease. It's eyes, it's, it's the spine, it's the kidney, it's the pancreas. So who owns these patients and how best can we have a stewardship for this patient so that it's all encompassed and not just have the scattered care? So for us, having drug therapy, medical oncologists have not entered this space up till now. As you can tell, I've had many, many patients with kidney cancer, but fortunately, I think because VHL patients have their kidneys taken care of so early, I've never had a patient with metastatic disease. But I think this is an opportunity for us. And one um, suggestion that I have for our group is, should there really be a tumor board specific like we have for other cancers for VHL where there could be a multidisciplinary approach, especially now that we have a drug, is this patient appropriate to have a drug? So as you have heard from all of the speakers today, we have a drug that we are extremely excited about, but it's at its infancy, right? So we are not ready to embrace this drug for every patient. Unlike most drugs that get FDA approved, you will find that um, the next Monday when patients come to clinic, all of us are offering these drugs to patients. This is not the case because I think, A, we are learning we are trying to figure out who this is best for. And we are also concerned about the whole journey of, of your disease, right? Where in it is it appropriate? What is it serving? What is the uh, price that you're paying in terms of side effects? As Ben said, nothing is free. I think each of every drug that you give comes with a price in terms of the side effects. And is that side effect uh, that you weigh um, better than the surgery and the outcome that will come from surgery. So this was a big part that I wanted to really share that I think this is an approach that the new specialty coming in with a drug treatment, which is very different for this disease. So I'm going to skip all of the about the drugs. You have heard about all of it. So I'll just make it really um, Simple to go to this last slide, really to talk about again who needs it, right? I've now in this last year since the drug has been approved seen many patients who have come in with who have had multiple surgeries requesting for this drug. I have turned down a, a 
after uh, a shared decision, really didn't think that some patients were appropriate. And I think some were very similar to what Dr. Srinivasan shared in terms of patients who were very young, who really had an indolent disease and felt that just because we have a drug, it doesn't mean that we have to give it to every patient. And there are some patients who could be safely watched, but it's there should the uh, need uh, arise. For the patients who have had it, I think some of our approaches in managing side effects as medical oncologists, we are quite comfortable with this approach as to when to stop, when to uh, decrease the dose, when to modify the dose. I think side effects typically, that's how we are managed with many cancer drugs. And I don't think this drug is uh, any different. The other things that are somewhat unique that I learned today was, especially with all of these scans that you're doing, what is the appropriate time for us to image patients who are on these drugs? I think as part of the study, it was done every uh, 12 weeks. So typically for most oncologic care, when we put somebody on a drug therapy, we do scans every three months. For patients being on this for a long haul, is three months the right approach? At some point, should we try to increase that duration? Should it be an MRI? Should it be a CT scan? They do come in, even these scans come in with radiation. We heard loud and clear from you about the concerns with contrast for scans, the gadolinium for MRI. So I I think all of these are important things for us to consider. Similarly, lab monitoring. I think, you know, the hemoglobin drop is common. It's more common early on. And then after a point, it stabilizes. Should blood monitoring be once a month? Should it be every two months? I think we are learning and uh, gaining experience from this so that we can tailor it for a given patient. And then um, how long to stay on the drug? For most people with malignancy in general, our approach has been that we keep them on the drug till either the drug loses its effectiveness or if the toxicity becomes too much. We don't know about this drug since we haven't had a lot of experience. I mean, that time period hasn't been too long for us to be able to come up with these sort of decisions. Finally, I'll just wrap up with where is belzutifan in at least as far as kidney cancer goes? For, uh, we sort of think about this, I think, in parallel, the drug development. So already belzutifan is being combined with other drugs, especially in the, uh, in the kidney space after patients have had their kidney removed, for especially those who are at a higher risk of the cancer coming back. We have used immunotherapy or checkpoint inhibitors, and there are now active trials combining belzutifan with immunotherapy. And then there are multiple trials looking at belzutifan uh, in the first line kidney cancer space. So for people who have metastatic disease, combining belzutifan with our existing therapy. So either with uh, some of the TKIs that are used, these are drugs that we give for patients with metastatic disease. And it's also being studied in these subsequent lines of therapy. So as I promised, I'm going to keep my uh, talk short. That allows you to have time for questions. We really appreciate Dr. Srinivasan coming up here and uh, giving us this lecture. And that's my research team up here. And I acknowledge them for all of the clinical trials that we are engaged in. So thank you again and really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you all today. Thanks, Dr. Srinivas. Um, so we've Let's let's open up for questions right now. Um, for anybody that has questions regarding drug therapy. So I, I have a question about um, central nervous system tumors and pheos with this drug. Are there? I'm understanding that they're not really being that belzutifan is not being specifically used for those right now that it's primarily for renal? I don't think that's true. It's yeah. a, 
thank you. Uh, no, it can be used for all of the, for patients. Again, you know, the drug is effective in the kidney. There's definitely shrinkage that we see in the CNS tumors as well as in the eye. So for any given patient with VHL, when drug therapy is appropriate, I think belzutifan would be an effective drug. Are there, are there clinical trials with uh, central nervous system or is that already done at this point? I think this trial included patients who had central nervous system. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Yes. Uh, I wanted to know this last year with Bazotifun being FDA approved, uh, is the data from the number of VHL patients who've been uh, uh, put on the drug being actively collected uh, in some sort of trial by the manufacturer? Is there some sort of option for the patients to provide th their data so that uh, we do get this further uh, nailed down as far as the f how to effectively use the drug? I don't know if you want to speak to whether there's the alliance picking up data on this. Thank you, that, that is a very good question. Uh, uh, I, th I think we're trying to figure out how to do this. I mean, this drug went from entering clinical trials to approval very, very quickly. So it's sort of, uh, and, and once it was approved, it started becoming used very widely in the community. Uh, so uh, there are efforts afoot now to try and figure out how best to collect all the data uh, in the post-approval uh, era. Uh, and I, I know that individual centers are going to do it. Uh, but I think we also need to come together as a group to try and see if instead of getting data on 40 or 50 patients at each center, we can get data on hundreds of patients. Uh, and uh, I, I think a point is very well taken. I think that, you know, th 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 that that effort is going to come. It's, I don't think it's in place at this point, but it will, I hope, be. Thank you. Other, other questions? Yeah. Um, you mentioned that we uh, it hasn't reached the median duration of response. What is like a what does that mean? Sorry, no problem. Um, Sandra, do you want to take it? Do you want to take it? Sure. In general, you know, when we look at clinical trials, one of the things that's asked is how long is this drug going to be effective for? So what that means here is that. People have not been on the drug long enough for us to know exactly how uh, long that response is going to be. So when they say median duration has not yet been reached, it just means people are on it that long that we don't know exactly what the median is going to be, the average is going to be. Which is a good thing. I mean, it's, it says two things. That one, we are still early in that process. So with longer follow-up, we may know exactly that answer. And the second may mean that people are still on it, that we don't know exactly that is it 12 months, is it 48 months, et cetera. Thank you. 